The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. When the Pharisees, with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, gathered around Jesus, they observed that some of his disciples ate their meals with unclean, that is, unwashed hands. For the Pharisees, and in fact all the Jews, do not eat without carefully washing their hands, keeping the tradition of their elders. And on coming from the marketplace, they do not eat without purifying themselves. And there are many other things that are, they have traditionally observed. The purification of cups and jugs and kettles and beds. So the Pharisees and scribes questioned him, why do your disciples not follow the tradition of the elders, but instead eat a meal with unclean hands? He responded, well did the Isaiah prophesy that about you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain they do not worship me, teaching as doctrine and human precepts. You discard God's commandments, but cling to human tradition. He summoned the crowds again and said to them, Hear me, all, you, all of you, and understand. Nothing that enters one from outside can defile that person, but things that come from within are what defile. From within people, from their hearts, come evil thoughts, unchastity, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, licentiousness, envy, blasphemy, arrogance, folly. All these evil come from within, and they defile. The Gospel of the Lord. As you know, whoa, as you know, I just got back from Israel and it's, you get to kind of experience these traditions firsthand uh, while, you live, while you visit there. For example, we were at the, a hotel at the Sea of Galilee and it's a kosher hotel, which really stinks <laughs> because you can't have milk with cow meat. So for dinner, we had great steaks, but faux soy desserts. So they were fake. They call it fake dairy, right? So I call them fairy desserts. <laughs> I remember it was in Jerusalem, and I walked into this elevator, and I pushed the button, and this snot-nosed 12-year-old kid says to me, you don't want this elevator. Well, yes, I do. No, you don't. I go, why? He says, it's a, it's a Sabbath elevator. Well, what does that mean? That means it closes and opens automatically on every single floor. And I was on the 10th floor. <laughs> I go, so I had to wait, so I got out. Because you can't push the button. Because in the Sabbath, you're not allowed to work. However, those kids were crazy mayhem, and the parents just stood there and read their paper as the kids made a complete mess of our hotel. So I'm seeing firsthand all of these rules and regulations that the Lord had. You couldn't eat pork, so we can have bacon for the whole trip. That was very miserable. And so I'm thinking, gosh, every time I hear the Old Testament and I think of all these rules and these traditions that they had. And believe it or not, what's interesting, all these foods that the Lord told them not to eat are really not good for you, like bacon, shellfish. I go, man, washing your hands before you eat. That's a really, that's a really good advice, which is interesting. God chose the Jews to get it right and to keep them really, really healthy. And everybody else, you're on your own. <laughs> but if you go there, and you see the, and this sounds really funny, the ladies would love this part, 
their skin on these on the on the Jews is so beautiful. It's so I don't know how to say, it's so soft because their food is kosher, it's GMO free, it's healthy, and they eat healthy. So in a sense, I was jealous because my skin is rotting away. <laughs> So we have all these traditions that Jesus was talking about. You guys make it sound like that eating bacon is like really a serious wrong thing to do. So Jesus is now establishing to the Jewish leaders the things that you consider tradition with a small t is like gospel truth, if you will. So as Catholic Christians, you know, we are really clear as to what needs to be believed and what needs to be done. And we have faith in morals, and then we have this thing called canon law and discipline. And so whenever I have conversations with somebody who starts bad mouth in the Catholic Church about no married priest, I go, you know what? That's a discipline. If you want to have your opinion that we should have married priests, I don't even care. I won't even get into that discussion. You know why? Because it doesn't change my life, it doesn't change the church, and it has nothing to do with what Jesus told us is dogma or doctrine. Does that make sense? Like for example, I've had somebody come up to me and say, that's not a true crucifix. Why? Because there's nothing under his feet. Really? So that's not a real Jesus crucifix then, because there's nothing under his feet. Then I had somebody call me the other day, says, that's not a true crucifix. There's no wound in Jesus' side. Of course, they refuse to give me their phone number so I can call them back that, hello, Jesus is still alive. He got the stab after he died. So people, it's amazing what nitpicking things happen about traditions that really aren't going to change somebody's salvation. Doctrine changes people's lives because these are truths that Jesus gave us and we don't have the option to say I don't believe it as Christians. We don't have that option. We don't have the option to say I don't believe this dogma. As a baptized Christian, as a baptized Catholic, you don't have an option. You must believe. Now if you don't fully understand, that's a different story. There's a lot of teachings I don't fully understand, but I believe them why? Because they are church doctrine, not church discipline. If somebody were to say, Father, your life depends on this, would you be willing to die for the discipline of married priests? Absolutely not. <laughs> I would not die for that. But if somebody said, is Jesus Christ Lord, would you die for that? Absolutely. Would I deny my faith? No way. Eternal life in my relationship with Jesus is way too important to deny a teaching of Jesus. Sacred tradition. Have you ever heard that word before? Anybody? Who has not heard that word before? Sacred tradition. Okay, so you all have all heard that, right? Well, you haven't heard it. Well, let me explain to you what that means. Because this is very important. Why? Because when you hear the word sacred tradition, you, be, you see a big T, capital T. This means we're talking dogma here and teachings of Jesus Christ. So when the apostles preached and the apostles wrote, that is sacred tradition. Whatever came out of their mouths, whatever they taught, those churches throughout all of the Roman Empire, Every apostle, whatever they taught, whether it's written in the scriptures or orally taught, it's part of our sacred tradition, that is divine revelation. Those are traditions of the teachings of the church we must die for. Devotion to the Blessed Mother. Those are traditions which we are to follow. Praying the Rosary to follow. Having devotion to the Blessed Mother is a requirement. If you notice, every single Eucharistic prayer has a reference to the Blessed Mother. In the night prayer, the priests pray before they go to bed, or religious. 
You have a choice to sing a Marian hymn or a Hail Mary. So that's a tradition that you must keep because the church tells us that honoring the Blessed Mother is what Jesus did. And since we imitate Jesus by honoring his mother. So we have an obligation to do that. Genuflecting on the right knee. Now in this crowd, it might be a little difficult. <laughs> Even for me, I've been trying to not push up on my knee when I genuflect. I realize I'm really out of shape now. <laughs> That's a good tradition. Now interesting, if you went to the Chaldean Mass today at 1 o'clock, during the Eucharistic prayer, you know what you do? You stand up. That's a sign of reverence in the Eastern Rite. But in the Western Rite, we kneel. It's a sign of reverence for us. Symbolically, it makes sense. Sign of the cross reminds us of our baptism and the redemption of Jesus Christ. That's a great tradition to keep. Here's a tradition I didn't know about until I entered the seminary. When you do the sign of the cross, you can take your three fingers, and when you do the sign of the cross, it reminds you of the Trinity, and then you stab your heart. It's like a fifth part to remind us of the stabbing of Jesus' side when he died. Is it a tradition I would die for? Maybe. There's a lot of things as Catholics that we believe. And because the way we believe, there's certain traditions that we do help us believe more in what we believe. Genuflecting reminds me that Jesus is in the tabernacle. I don't genuflect every time, I'll give you that. But when I, walk into the, when I walk into the sacristy here, we have a priest chapel there. We have a little crack in the door. First thing I do is I, I look at Jesus and I say hello. When I'm coming across here late at night, when I'm walking up, I'll either genuflect or I'll say hello to Jesus. If I'm walking over here, why? Because I want to be reminded. You guys remember this tradition? You drive by a Catholic church, what do you do? Sign of the cross. If you ask my generation, they have no idea what you're talking about. Because it's not a tradition we learned because we weren't trained to re remind us that Jesus is present there. What is disgusting is the word hypocrisy that Jesus talks about. It's when you have Catholics, the leadership, all the way down to the laity, who are unwilling to change their lives, sinfully speaking, and downtrod or get in people's faces saying you need to change your life you need to change your life and they're unwilling to change themselves now if you admit like I admit that I need confession I try to go at least once a week because I know I'm a sinner I don't have the gift of hypocrisy <laughs> why even if I have committed the same sins I'm telling somebody not to do, I don't want to commit those sins. Versus a hypocrite doesn't even care. He has no desire to change his life or her life. So if you have committed a sin and you see somebody committing the same sin you have, you still can say, hey, you know, that's wrong. I'm a sinner. I used to do that. I try really, really hard not to do that. Versus, you stop doing that, and that's all you do. See, holiness is a transformation from within. That's what makes us different from other faiths. Because we believe that Jesus transforms us inside. That's why he talks about all those evil things that what defile somebody comes from inside. We've got to get those out. Because you know when you talk to somebody, they have certain spirits about them that just aren't godlike. And when you call them on it, they don't want to change. I said, well, there's always purgatory. <laughs> we have so much to learn in our faith. You know, we, the reason why we brought Sybil on into our, our catechetical structure of our parish is because we know there's too much to learn. You can't be an expert in our faith. And there's no way that every priest, every nun, every brother, every teacher, every catechist can know everything. There's some people I know who know quite a bit. 
But these dogmas and these doctrines, this truth, they do bring life. It brings enlightenment, brings freedom. And these traditions that we have in our faith now, they're really good, they're really cool. Adoration, come on, that's one of the best traditions we have in our parish for outside the mass. Because you could spend time with Jesus face to face. That's a tradition I would die for. Because it has to deal with Jesus in the Eucharist. What I wear, I bought this in Israel because it's the lightest thing I could find there. <laughs> if they told me we want to make these now pink tutus, I wouldn't agree with it, but I'd wear it if the Pope told me to. <laughs> Out of obedience. See that spirit of obedience. We rack our heads all the time. We call the diocese all the time. We check the catechism. We look in canon law. We always look to do what is right, even when I don't like it. When Rome said that only the priest and the deacon can purify the chalices, that made my life really miserable because I have to go all the way back to the sacristy after I meet everybody after mass and I have to purify seven chalices. But you know what? I'm not gonna be disobedient because I don't want that spirit of disobedience to rub off on you. Even though it's something that the church has asked me to do, purifying the precious blood in the chalices is very important. That tradition is something worth dying for because it has to deal with the Eucharist. And people ask me all kinds of questions. Can I do this? Can I do that? And there are a lot of gray areas. Should I go to my, my child's wedding if it's outside the church? Those are gray areas. It's not a clear cut. My child wants to get baptized in a different church. What do I do? You love them. That's what you do. So there's certain things that aren't clear, but there are some things that are really clear, and there are some traditions dying for, and there are some dogmas worth dying for. The hard part is figuring it out, right? But because I'm a highly trained professional, I can help you and guide you through that discernment of what we as Catholics could do, should do, and want to do. So we're always here to help you with those uh, decisions. I get, we get asked questions all the time because it's very difficult. Because I remember when I was in that situation where I didn't know what to do, what was right, what was wrong, what we believed. And I don't like to be in ignorance. Nobody likes that. We all love truth. We all like to know what's right. And so we have the answer here in our faith. Some mysteries you'll never figure out. The Trinity, good luck with that. But the day-to-day, -day, the stuff that we get into, the messy stuff called life, some things are clear, some aren't. But at least your church is here for you to help you navigate through this stormy thing we call life. I would die for doctrine. I wouldn't die for discipline. The question you have to ask yourself is, would you die for doctrine?